This diagram that you are looking at is called the Overton Window, created by political scientist Joseph Overton. In the Overton Window, you will see mainstream policy that has been implemented in the middle. Here lies concepts like seatbelts in cars, and regulations on the time and temperature chicken should be cooked. To my knowledge, there is no serious activist group online or IRL who is pro-Salmonella or shitting for 48 hours on the toilet due to food poisoning. Hence, policy. Just above and below policy are ideas that are popular but have not been implemented in policy. This can include cannabis legalization in many countries that have not legalized it yet. Or, in the US, it could include government-provided universal health care. Above and below popular, you get sensible ideas. This could include proposals that are based on rational arguments, even though they make some people uncomfortable such as decriminalizing payments for pleasure. As you move away from the Overton window, you move on to what is deemed acceptable, but still rather unpopular and far away from policy implementation. Ideas like running government-run grocery stores probably fit into this category. Then you move on to radical positions, such as supporting police abolition, which is great if you enjoy the experience of being robbed at knife point. At the end of the spectrum, you have the unthinkable, which involves state mandates to allow zoophiles to mate with farm livestock. I don't know if there's a WhatsApp group or subreddit which promotes human-cattle relationships, but I wouldn't be surprised at this point. Now keep in mind that the Overton window is not static. It moves depending on time, place, and even online community. Women's equal access to education is a policy most of us in the developed world would think is, well, policy. But it's unthinkable in the Taliban's Afghanistan, which bans women from hearing each other's voices. Child labor used to be widespread before efficient industrialization. Even when policies banned the practice, it was still popular. But as families in Britain became more wealthy, and as industrial technology didn't require as much low-skill labor, the concept of child labor became unthinkable. The same is true for different online movements, having vastly different internal Overton windows that are not in lockstep with the rest of society's Overton window. For example, having women tattoo their body count on their forehead is popular in Andrew Tate's online war room, but I doubt it would pass a referendum. I think 99% of the world's problems would be solved if females walked through life with their body count on their forehead. Because it would prevent, because it would prevent all of the disintegration of morals it would prevent so many things about the world. What was popular in the past is oftentimes unthinkable today, and likewise, what is unthinkable today might be popular in the future. And speaking of the future, let's delve into some predicting on what online movements we can expect to see in the near future. Keep in mind, as much as I would like to believe that I am a hyper-omniscient internet god who can predict the future, I am not. What I am going to do is engage in some educated speculation on the near future. Please keep in mind that me making these predictions does not mean that I'm endorsing any of these movements, counter movements, new ideas, rehashed ideas, or overall trends. I'm just stating what I believe to be most likely to happen soon, whether I or you like it or not. The first movement would be an anti-Trump backlash. Whether you think Trump is good, bad, or ugly, what we can all agree on is that he's a cultural force to be reckoned with. No one else, with the possible exceptions of Elon Musk and Putin, attracts the same degree of reverence, disgust, respect, fear, disrespect, worship, rage, loyalty, hatred, inspiration, and mockery. Hey, Satan! I don't want to right now. What? Hey, relax! Come on, Satan, I've been working hard all day! During Trump's first presidency, a massive backlash ensued in town halls and voting booths, along with Hollywood studios, street protests, and virtually every social media platform. The backlash was known as the resistance. It was centered primarily around identity politics, seeing Trump and his movement as sexist, racist, xenophobic, and transphobic. While the resistance was successful in defeating Trump in 2020, particularly due to COVID and the ensuing economic crisis, it did garner a great deal of disdain, including from many people who also hated Trump. 
You don't need to pray at the Trump before every meal to realize that two-year-olds might not be old enough to undergo hormone replacement therapy. This was most seen online, where resistance figures were usually seen as self-aggrandizing, hypermoralizing, and dare I say cringe. I'm nasty, like my blood stains on my bed. With Trump out of office, many people in the resistance had let their guard down online and offline. The excesses of identity politics during this period fueled the anti-woke movement, which Trump used to garner support. The most notable flashpoint was the ad that went viral in 2024 titled, Kamala is for they them, President Trump is for you. However, with Trump back in office in 2025, his honeymoon has proven to be short. His popularity is already in decline, and his trade policies have led to significant backlashes within online circles in and outside of the United States. Most Americans, even MAGA types, don't want to work in a Bengali-style sweatshop making clothes for socialists like Hassan Piker to wear while he preaches against consumerism. Since quote-unquote wokeness failed to challenge Trump in the short run, a new backlash against Trump's populism and MAGA will most likely emerge. I believe that there are two major contenders for this backlash that we'll start to see online very soon. The first is economic populism. Having a billionaire in the White House while many people are struggling to make men's meet may drive people towards organized labor, social democracy, and even socialism and communism. Issues related to class rather than race. The internet could aid in organizing labor activism in these service and white collar sectors that have lagged in unionization compared to the blue collar unions of the early 20th century, long before the internet existed. Instagram in particular has exposed many ordinary people to the lifestyles of the excessively rich, creating the illusion that this is the norm. This might lead to increased scrutiny on the excesses of the wealthy and an increase of left-wing economic populism as more young people are being bombarded with Instagram girls lavished in jewelry on yachts, all because they are okay with some Qatari multimillionaire taking a dump on them. Another anti-populist backlash could come in the form of greater support for democratic institutions and rule of law. We have seen this already with the No Kings protest, which brought about massive protests in the street using the internet as a medium to spread the word. Putting Trump aside, another backlash movement that I predict will happen is one against the pro-Palestine movement. Now before you start typing angry comments, I am simply here to predict what I think will happen, regardless of whether or not it's good. We have seen that movements which gain a tremendous amount of traction and dominate the conversation only usually do so for a few years before a backlash ensues. Now, I don't believe that this backlash will necessarily be pro-Israeli. I don't think people will start wearing Kiss Me I'm a Zionist t-shirts or naming their kids BB or selling Netanyahu refrigerator magnets. But when the dust settles in Gaza and there are no longer daily occurrences of Palestinians dying, many will start to question some of the Hamas apologism coming from the movement and elements of Palestinian society and culture in general. Elements which, let's just say, would not be permitted in your typical pro-Palestine student activist group. This movement, after all, combines Islamists, Arab nationalists, woke students, communists, red pillars, and even the Pepe crowd. Having so many different activist groups under one banner, even though they all hate each other on virtually every other issue, is going to lead to a collapse of the movement once the hot war ends. It's also worth keeping in mind that ideologies survive when they are successful, and they fizzle out when they fail. While the pro-Palestine movement has been remarkably successful on the information war, it has been an abysmal failure on the military front. Iran and its proxy groups have failed so miserably on the battlefield that this will most likely mean that their brand of Islamism will lose popularity just as Arab nationalism did after it failed to be a rallying cry against Israel. However, I can still see Islamist groups being a fringe online presence in the way that, say, other formerly powerful ideologies like Marxist-Leninism and neo-Yahtzees have. I could also see a growing ex-Muslim online movement which was not very prominent during the days of the New Atheist, but has gained momentum with the likes of e-influencers such as the Apostate Prophet and Harris Sultan. Another movement that will probably gain momentum are femcells, 
With the current dating market being a massive failure, there are less and less young people in long-term relationships, falling in love, starting families, or even humping. This crisis is currently hitting young men hard as men usually have to build themselves up with status and resources to attract women. While this has led to all sorts of pseudo-alpha male cringe, it will also lead to a large number of women who enter their late 30s and 40s without a partner, let alone children. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some people who don't need companionship or sex, Cornhub and vibrators are just fine for them, but most people do want to have relationships with someone who loves them and wants to rub genitals together. As a result, many women will probably end up lonely and frustrated. Some will seek themselves communities as a form of catharsis on the internet. Prepare to see a lot of terminally online single women who unironically call themselves queens. Now, on a more positive note, I do see some online circles who will look to underappreciated ancient wisdom to find meaning and purpose, such as the mindfulness of Buddhism or the classical philosophy of Stoicism or Epicureanism. These modern online renditions will not be carbon copies of what was practiced over 2000 years ago, but rather will be versions of ancient ideas crafted for a 21st century audience.